Right, so um, welcome everyone again and uh, welcome those of you who are joining. And uh, we're going to start now with one of the most difficult topics uh, that we've had in the pandemic in relation to long-term care, I'd say. And I say difficult because some, some things are obvious to do. Um, so for example, you know, maybe testing is quite obvious as a measure that you'd have to, to try and reduce the, the, the probability of people getting the virus. But there have been some measures that have been adopted and that are still being adopted that, that are arguably also very harmful and that have caused a huge amount of pain and distress. And uh, while we all want to protect lives, we, we all agree on the importance of, of, in, of, of infection prevention and control, we also need to be aware that the care and good care, which is what we are trying to provide in this sector, is not only about protection from infection, but it's also about ensuring that people's emotional, physical, mental well-being is all considered and also the well-being of those who love and care for them. And I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that we're going to start this session with a personal testimony from Kate Meacock, and who is a um, member of Rights for Residents UK, and who's going to share a bit uh, with us how this has been for her the last 20 months. And thank you so much for joining us, Kate. That's all right, thank you. Thank you for yeah, asking us along. Um, yeah, so my name is um, Kate Miko, uh, and my mum's been in a care home uh, for six years. Um, she's 76 and has very advanced dementia. Uh, I used to visit mum about three times a week, and she's just over an hour away from me, but I would go give her lunch, chat about the family, what we've been up to, take my dog in to see her, which all the other residents loved, um, and just be a part of the wider family um, on her floor. I go through the doors of the lounge and uh, I'd say hi mama and her eyes would sparkle blue her face would go bright pink and she'd burst out laughing and sort of shout mummy 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 and she was always really excited to see me um, and then on March the 12th last year I went to see my mum and she was in bed um, and I stood there for a bit with the two nurses and we talked about what was going on um, how mum was uh, and they were very worried about many of the residents they all had colds and at this stage testing wasn't readily available. Um, this would be the last time I'd properly see my mum for 365 days. Uh, the clo home closed the next day to all visitors um, and at this stage I'm sure as with everyone else no one, none of us could imagine possibly you know possibly imagine how long this was going to last or what was going to happen um, but you know during those first few weeks Yes, it was stressful, um, but there was also an understanding from me that they were protecting mum. They were doing the right thing and they were doing everything they could. Uh, the carers were amazing and doing all that they could under very difficult and uh, stressful circumstances. Um, I mean, about 10 days after the home closed, the country was put into lockdown. And uh, on that day, I also received a, an email from the care home manager to say that someone in the resident, in the, some, one of the residents had tested positive. Um, but they were in hospital, not in the care home. And to be fair to my mum's care home, until last week, they haven't had a COVID outbreak. Um, so uh, incredible the, the, how, they've, how they've dealt with it. Um, but the weeks would go by, communication from the home and head office was quite sparse. And, you know, we were encouraged to look for Facebook for updates and book a Skype call. Um, and it wouldn't be until about the middle of April that I got my first Skype call, so a month after. Uh, with my mum uh, and it was actually really lovely to see her but um, as I'm sure you will know for someone with advanced dementia Skype just is incredibly difficult and really doesn't work um, she had to have one of the carers with her she can't hold anything so she had a carer with her you know to sit there ring me hold the phone encourage my mum to try and speak to me to help her try and understand that it was me on the telephone um, and in reality, really, it was a two minute call, see how she looked, catch up with the nurse, see how they were all doing. Um, and, you know, mum would sit and look at the person sitting next to her holding the telephone and not me. And it's, it, it's difficult. You couldn't I couldn't talk my normal rubbish because you have no privacy. Um, there's someone there sitting next 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 to next to her. Um, but then, you know, I could see my mum through Skype sort of every 10 days or so. Um, and then, you know, the weeks turned into months and the guidance for the rest of the country unlocking started to come out. 
and care homes weren't mentioned really. Um, and then was it midsummer 2020, eventually the news came we'd all been waiting for, uh, that they'd start to let a single person in. Um, and for me, this was an outside visit, five meters apart, full PPE. Um, but the joy I felt at being able to see my mum again was amazing. Um, the reality of sitting so far apart, uh, she didn't know I was there. Um, and again, no privacy. All uh, my 30 minute uh, visits were all supervised. Um, and I was sitting there five meters away and the carer was sitting next to her holding her hand. So it's hard, um, but I was able to see her. Um, and I did, I saw her four times between July and October last year, um, mainly due to the lack of time slots available and the good old English weather. Um, but uh, anyway, autumn came and the care home completely closed again. Um, despite guidance at this stage, they did encourage or said you could have indoor visits with a substantial screen and it just didn't happen. Um, Christmas came and went and there was a talk of testing and letting families in and again, it was never gonna happen. Um, and it's very difficult to explain the roller coaster of ups and downs, um, that feeling of hope that you might be able to see your loved one again, followed by this huge drop when you just realize it's, it's just not gonna happen. Um, and every month, every news conference you follow and little bits of guidance were put out. Um, but you know, all the time my mum was basically deteriorating. Uh, so we spent, you know, I spent Christmas and her birthday with a two minute Skype call. Um, and then I think the next few months, so from Christmas through to March were probably the worst. We were, we were allowed a window visit, half an hour, standing outside looking at my mum through double glazed doors with a carer sitting next to her. Um, there's no way of communicating, the windows, the doors don't open. So you're just trying to shout through a window. Um, you're just mainly looking at someone really. She can't talk, she's totally immobile. Um, she has very, you know, she can't focus. Um, you know, bin lorry would turn up, delivery drivers would pass her by, and it's it's something that I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, then March 2021, and the guidance changed again, um, and exactly a year to the day, I was able to go into my mum's home to a visiting room, have a lateral flow test, put on, put on full PPE, um, and actually sit and hold my mum's hand for 30 minutes, supervised but it was incredible. Um, and she just wouldn't let go. She just laughed and laughed and it really was, it was wonderful. Um, and now from June onwards, I, I, I can go into her room. Um, I arrive by appointment. Um, I show my negative test. I have my temperature taken. I have my oxygen levels taken. I put my mask and apron and gloves on and I'm escorted to her room. Uh, but I can sit there, I can give her lunch. I can spend as long as I like with her. Um, she has deteriorated. Um, she's now on pureed food. Um, she's lost all her speech, anything that she had. She occasionally laughs. I can get her, get to her. It takes about 15 or 20 minutes to get through to her sometimes. Um, a lot of the time she'll just sit there with her eyes shut. But we are in her room. We have privacy. I can talk the rubbish I want to talk. Um, I'm classed as her essential caregiver. Um, so in theory, I can go in whenever I want. Um, though. There was an outbreak last week and that got stopped momentarily, but I'm now allowed back in. Um, we've come a long way, but it's, you know, I've lost 20, 20 months of mum's life and she's lost connection with her wider family. And I'll, I'll never really know if her deterioration of, in her dementia journey has been accelerated because of the lack of contact. Um, I think also the longer term mental effects of what has happened they're going to be around for a long time. I'm not sure that I will ever get over looking at my mum through a window. Um, and for many, they never got to see their loved ones uh, properly before they before they died. Um, and then, you know, so just as part of the Rights for Residents campaign in England, um, I run the Twitter account. Uh, we just we want to make sure that this can never happen again and that those in our care homes can never be completely separated from their friends or families over a long period of time. Um, and we just, you know, we need to make sure that every care home resident, when they, someone goes into care, they can nominate that family member or friend who will always be part of their um, care team and will always, you know, remain in close contact with them. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so it, it's, it's been a long, it's been a long 20 months. Um, but yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much, Kate. And I think it's so important. We're going to now hear about some research and I, and I do believe that, that the way you are telling us how it felt and what it meant to you. And sometimes we will hear, yes, there was a window visit of that, but you don't get it and, 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 and like we do the way you're explaining us oh, but, the, the yeah. reality of this. And um, yeah, and thank well, you. It's good for that, yeah, thank you. And uh, yes, so thank you for speaking up. So uh, um, we're now going to hear the, on the, the research side and we're going to start uh, with a presentation from Canada, uh, from Janice O'Keefe. So thank you so much for joining us. And while you get the slides, uh, I am going to read out the title that we have, which uh, family visitation programs during COVID-19 long-term care restrictions the role and experience of staff in this is from research in Canada. Thank you very much. Janice. Thanks very much. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, you can project them. So if you move to the right a bit. Um, where are you? If I move to the right. Well, I'm... The cursor at the bottom or you can do. Okay, okay. So it's the wrong screen. Okay, sorry. Just one sec. We could see them. We just needed to. No, no. Them. I had the. Uh, you had the original. Is this better? Yes. Thank you. Okay. That's great. So thanks very much for the introduction. Yes, I'm on the east coast of Canada. So, uh, and we've been part of a, a team that's been looking at family visitation programs during COVID-19. Uh, I have presented with the long-term care group of the experience of staff. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience. I can tell you that, uh, Kate, there's very many people in Canada who experienced exactly very similar, uh, maybe not quite as long though, I, I would say, uh, but very similar uh, difficulty in trying to re to connect with people. And the outcome of that was uh, quite horrific in terms of deconditioning of individuals. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk today about um, the visitation program. It's part of a, a larger um, program of research we have at the Nova Scotia Centre on Aging. We've looked at uh, physical plant and physical design of homes in our care and construction project. We've looked at who seeks help from who in terms of advice across uh, Canada in terms of direct care, um, the directors of care. We just finished a, a five-year project on uh, seniors adding life to years called SALTY. And this is a very large team with multiple uh, 22 researchers and uh, numerous uh, policymakers and decision makers, uh, residents, family members uh, guiding us. And uh, it was on the quality of life of residents in long term care. It ended just as COVID was starting. So it's very interesting to have been immersed in that field and then realize when something like this pandemic happens, just you know, again, how underfunded uh, this sector is. So we've done a series of projects on uh, COVID-19. Uh, right now we're in the uh, middle of interviewing uh, staff around their mental health, but I'm gonna share with you today our project on long-term care and, and family visitation um, that we've been doing. In the future, we're going to do some more work linking some of the data from outcomes of residents with staff. So what we did is in two different uh, provinces in Canada. So just a reminder, we're 13 different jurisdictions, 10 provinces, three territories. Uh, two of those provinces on the East Coast, Prince Edward Island and Nova Scotia. Uh, we had uh, uh, facilities, six facilities that we were partnered with, um, different range uh, size of beds, uh, not overly large, 36 to 120. Some were run by government, some were private for profit, and some for uh, not for profit. Um, the traditional homes are usually built earlier and more of a floor-based hospital type setting and the neighborhoods are typically uh, you know 10 to 15 residents per neighborhood. So when we did this data collection I'm going to share with you the results from the staff uh, survey but our um, 
our, our data collection actually included facility profiles. We also uh, collected all the documents from those facilities around policies. There's 108 documents in, in total. Uh, we had 10 key informant interviews with three different places, British Columbia, uh, the Eng England and the Netherlands. And that was uh, people from government long-term care as well as academics. Um, and then the, the main sort of focus was the family and staff interviews. So in total, we did 138 interviews in a very short period of time between March and August uh, 2021. And I'm going to share with you those interviews with the staff that implemented the family visitation program and the interviews with the direct care staff. So the family, just to give you a sense, um, each province pulled out uh, uh, public health directives around who could visit when and when there was a lockdown. And so there was this um, family visitation put into place. Initially, it was just one designated caregiver. Um, they were called partners in care in one province, designated caregiver in the other. And then it eventually moved up to up to three designated caregivers and uh, a number of different family visitors. There were different rules for depending you were a designated caregiver or a family member. <clears throat> so we um, I'm going to talk about first uh, the staff experiences and the factors that uh, enabled or inhibited the implementation of the family program uh, for the staff. So the staff, um, one of the big challenges for them was the top down uh, process that um, occurred uh, with government. So it was very much externally driven. Um, although families um, and staff supported family member visitation, there was really little way on the best the best way to implement the directive. There was no guidance on how to implement, just restrictions and the rules that the, the homes had to meet. So some implementation um, staff found it difficult to be given a directive with, rely, with uh, reliable information when they didn't only had to do the logistics of implementing. And other implementation staff said there were many changes and the changes weren't always clear. So they were constantly uh, updating the, the rules and there was no flexibility at the home level to be able to implement it. There was also uh, time restraints that made it very difficult to engage the families and the direct care staff in terms of what would be um, that whole process of implementation. Um, they mentioned they'd like to include the families that they had, as they had done in other programs that they had implemented in the home, but they just didn't have any time. It was basically announced in a, a press release on television, and then the families were at their door demanding to get entry. So um, this was a huge issue in terms of it. Uh, they were always having to play catch up from the press conference. So implementing the directive was complex. It involved individual problem solving at the facility level on how to best balance the need to keep residents safe, PPE uh, availability, the public health protocols, while trying to be flexible on the how and when families could visit. It was certainly an advantage when facilities could be flexible when they were implementing the directive by adjusting uh, staff to cover the new responsibilities. So in some cases, the implementation was done by rec recreation uh, departments. Sometimes it was done by the administrator or the manager. Um, responsibilities for booking the visits or screen visits also varied. Sometimes it was even a, a, a security was uh, brought in when home uh, hired outside security to help with the screening. Sometimes rec 
Recreation did the screening. Um, in Nova Scotia in particular, they had just developed these long-term care assistant positions and the provincial government actually gave further funding for that. And so that was um, able to, uh, they were able to use those assistants uh, to help with this type of implementation. And some of the uh, staff said they were the superstars of the program. It really couldn't have happened without them. There was also some issues around um, uh, the, the space impacting the visiting schedule. Sometimes uh, the home didn't have sufficient space in their common room to be able to sell, to, to have safe distances. Uh, they weren't allowed to visit in their room originally. Uh, sometimes it was in like a board room, which was not very conducive to visiting and so on. So some of the enablers, um, certainly from the staff's perspective, that organizational culture was most commonly discussed, uh, specifically the team working um, uh, the working among the staff, being open and positive, the, st the staff will willing to pivot and go above and beyond and, um, and, and switch their responsibility or their roles. There's a lot of support from upper management, such as morale boosters. They were very patient. They were answering questions. All of that was really, um, really, really valued and an enabler to the implementation. Um, that staff buy-in buy was also critical to implementation. Most staff were really excited that the family were able to get back in to the home and um, you know they they were on board with it because they understood what the uh, benefits would be be. They also had very good communication process uh, within the facilities, frequent, straightforward, excellent communication was described as enabler to the implementation, um, bringing the staff together to talk about it. Um, sometimes uh, having uh, question and answer discussions with government about what was available. Um, they, they saw that um, uh, the whole uh, implementation with family was also very important. Um, some of the barriers, though, uh, certainly was the uh, last minute communication or lack of communication. So that could be a barrier as well. So when that happened, staff were left confused and then they would give uh, it, potentially having a ripple effect because they would give family members misinformation and um, families would then hear this these mis messages from different types of staff and then this became very difficult because uh, then the staff became the monitors and they had to uh, remind the families of the rules so that that was never viewed by staff as very positive. Danny, so we can wrap up a bit. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm going too slow. Okay, just to say that, thank you. Um, there was a lot of uh, similarities, I think, across the two, the different key informants across our different groups. Um, and there was um, a lot of challenges in terms of the overall impact on the staff. Uh, they would already been stored staff, very similar to some of the uh, issues that were already said. I won't, uh, I won't read these, but there was also huge impact on the residents, obviously, mental well-being, the, uh, as, as was uh, stated by Kate, you know, getting back in there, he, he was able to, um, uh, you know, their mood was much better. Um, certainly those family visitation programs had benefit for both, uh, both the resident and the family. So I'll leave it there. Uh, sorry, I went too long. I, sh I should have been more cog cognizant here, but uh, happy to answer any questions about the, the kind of thing uh, that we experienced in Canada. And that just to say that that family visitation program can be seen as a blueprint that we could use in future outbreaks and we're using this information to help with our national standards for long-term care that we're developing in Canada and I'll talk a bit more about that yes tomorrow in six minutes thanks thank you very much Janice and uh, and, I, and I really appreciate the importance of having all these research in place so that something like this 
does not happen again. Uh, and I we uh, yeah, thank you. So okay. we're uh, going to move to uh, that study. Um, Ramona Backhouse, unfortunately, is unwell, but we're really grateful to her colleague, uh, Judith uh, Orlings, I don't know if I pronounced it right, for stepping in and presenting on her behalf. The title of the paper is The Impact of COVID-19 Vaccinations in Dutch Nursing Homes Back to Normal is the question. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Adria. Thank you for having me on such a short notice. Um, can you see my slides all right? Yeah, perfect. Thank yeah, you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Judith Erlings. I work for the Living Lab in Aging and Long-Term Care, affiliated to Maastricht University. And I'm standing in today for Ramona Bakhaus, who is uh, unfortunately struck by the disease that, well, is the start of this uh, uh, this this uh, conference uh, today and tomorrow. Um, from our side, we would like to share the results and experiences uh, from a longitudinal survey study that we've started up in the um, COVID pandemic in the Netherlands. And I'm going to focus a little bit today on the survey that we sent out just after the vaccination campaign was completed in the, um, in the nursing homes. But to give a little bit of context, I'm starting from the, uh, from the beginning in March 2020, when the nursing homes in the Netherlands uh, closed. And it was a scenario much like um, uh, Kate illustrated very touchingly um, uh, earlier. Um, so nursing homes closed on uh, the 20th of March, I think, in, uh, uh, in the entire country, but in the south, southern part of the country where we are located in Maastricht, uh, we were already a bit uh, early, earlier than, uh, than that. It was the, the precautionary principle that came into, uh, came into practice. We were very much touched by the uh, images that we saw from the southern European countries, uh, from uh, Spain, uh, Italy, um, and therefore this very drastic uh, measure was put into place. Um, in our case, this meant uh, a highly restrictive measure, not only banning visitors, uh, but also volunteers, um, uh, caregivers, informal caregivers, and also um, um, non-essential health services like dentists, physical therapists, occupational uh, therapists, were only allowed into the nursing homes if highly uh, necessary. And of course, also in the Netherlands, a lot of creative alternative em alternatives emerged. So the, the window visiting, uh, some uh, nursing homes um, had a separate container in, the, uh, in their gardens or yards where residents could meet their uh, families. But even though there were a lot of creative alternatives, that was of course no real alternative and there was still serious challenges to residents' autonomy. And for us as researchers, it was also important that uh, primary data was lacking. We had um, no primary data on the impact of this, uh, this physical ban on residents, on family members, on uh, nursing uh, professionals. Um, and in uh, May, I think, May 2020, we were approached by the uh, Ministry for Health, Sports and Welfare in the Netherlands. Um, and we were asked to evaluate the effect of the lifting of the visitors ban in the first 25 nursing homes who, um, uh, who lifted their visiting bans. And we were interested in that point um, in the effect on well-being for residents. And we were also interested in the compliance to protective measures by residents, by staff, by family members. And I think we were one of the first uh, research groups worldwide who published our primary data and our experiences with the lifting of visitors' bans. Um, later on, we expanded the group of nursing homes that we followed to 76. And we had several other uh, surveys. Um, the next one was in the fall of 2020. Uh, just we were on the brink of the second wave here in the, um, in the Netherlands. We focused um, on, on whether nursing homes were pre prepared for that, for that second wave. For example, we looked into um, the availability of personal protective equipment, which was scarce in the first wave. 
Um, but we were also interested in uh, um, how what plans nursing homes had to um, uh, to to make it possible for residents to still have visits and to have some sort of autonomy in the um, uh, even in times where viral circulation in society was high. Um, and most recently, we had a new survey in the spring of 2021, uh, right after the vaccination campaign uh, in the in the Netherlands. And our goal here was to assess the impact of vaccination on the daily life and on visitation of Dutch nursing home uh, residents. Um, just like in many other countries, I think residents and staff of nursing homes were among the first to be vaccinated. We started. Um, in January 2021. Um, and again, we approached seven, the 76 nursing homes that we've been following for a long time, and we had a response rate of 78%. So almost 60 nursing homes responded, wow. and all surveys uh, were completed by a contact person, a professional contact person within the organization. And we saw that on average, 77% of residents uh, of the nursing homes were fully vaccinated, but there was quite a range uh, of differences between nursing homes. So in the majority of nursing homes, uh, over 80% of residents were fully vaccinated at that point, while in 20% of the nursing homes, it was still less than 60% of residents fully vaccinated. Uh, we also asked about why residents uh, would deny vaccination or would not have a vaccination. Um, and at that point in time, the most nursing homes uh, indicated that they were still waiting for a second dose. Um, there was only a small minority who was not vaccinated for other reasons. For example, people who had fragile health status or a very short uh, life expectancy. Um, some people did not get consent from a family member um, and in a small minority, but there was also a fear of side effects or low confidence in the, uh, in the vaccine. That was a bit different uh, if we look at the um, staff members. Um, in the Netherlands, due to privacy regulations, employers cannot ask or register the vaccination status of their, uh, of their staff. But we asked the respondents, so the contact person in the nursing home, whether they could give a reliable estimation um, of uh, how many, uh, what percentage of uh, staff was vaccinated, according to them. Um, and two thirds of the respondents indicated that they they were able to give a reliable estimation, and they estimated that 65% of staff in the nursing homes was vaccinated. But again, even more than with resident, there was a very great variation, very large variation between uh, nursing homes. Um, the reasons for not getting vaccinated were quite consistent um, between the homes. Uh, most important reason uh, mentioned was um, reasons related to pregnancy or fertility, so people being pregnant, uh, trying to uh, be, trying to conceive, uh, being current breastfeeders. Um, and secondly, the fear of side effects and fears of fear of long-term uh, vaccination effects related to uh, vaccination was mentioned. 70% of the nursing homes said that they uh, released the protective measures, so they had less protective measures uh, after a vaccination, but still we saw that um, the normal life or the daily living hadn't normalized at that uh, point. There was still a quite strict policy related to um, social distancing, so no hugs um, allowed. Um, people were not allowed to uh, bring pets, to stay for dinner, to maybe sleep over. Um, and we also saw that quite a large percentage of nursing homes um, still had visiting hours. So family members and informal care caregivers were not welcome at any point of the, um, of the day but where um, visiting was restricted to, to a few hours uh, over the day. We did see some normalization of activities after the vaccination campaign, especially uh, related to resident-resident interactions. So the uh, activities um, in nursing homes uh, for residents only, they normalized. Um, 
the number of volunteers that was active in the nursing that's active in the nursing home uh, was still lower at that point um, than before the pandemic. So we see that volunteers not hadn't always come back um, to the normal tasks uh, after uh, the vaccination. That often had to do with the fact that, this, that at this point, volunteers or so members of the general community had not been vaccinated. And traditionally, a lot of volunteers are also um, uh, yeah, people in the higher age groups and therefore more, yeah, more vulnerable than the, uh, than the general population. So in conclusion, we see that even after um, vaccination, normality had not been uh, reached in the nursing homes. And what was especially striking to us is that a large portion of nursing homes also stated that they had no plan or vision on how to normalize daily living in nursing homes. So there was a lot of nursing home um, uh, contact persons who were waiting on more information from either the government or the, um, the, the larger organization or the region or the um, um, nursing association, for example. Uh, they were waiting for tips and tricks and a vision on how to, how to proceed in the normalization of daily uh, living. Therefore, we see that family visits still differ uh, very much compared to the pre-pandemic situation. And family might still have been a risk factor especially as family was often not vaccinated at that uh, point. And therefore, we also plead for tailor-made solutions um, to develop a vision on how we can reach, um, how we can reach normality in, uh, in nursing homes. Um, thank you all for, this, uh, for your attention so far. Um, maybe I'm adding to this presentation who has been made before the plans that we had that we are currently carrying out a new um, survey study, uh, so a follow-up on uh, this one, on which we where we focus on um, uh, pressure, that is on nursing staff, um, uh, sick leave, and um, yeah, more, in any case, more on the staff of, a, of the nursing homes and the effects that the prolonged pandemic has on uh, them. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer questions. So I'm, I'm very sorry we'll have to, to wrap up the session because we are a little bit over time. But this is such a, and thank you so much for these excellent presentations and the personal testimony from Kate. This is without a doubt uh, an incredibly important topic that we will be coming back to. I think earlier in the chat, I think Catherine shared the previous webinar where we had uh, uh, also a video and the slides. We will do, and more dedicated webinars to this, where we'll be looking in in, de uh, in more depth and with more time at this extremely, extremely important issue. And I do hope we'll manage, if you know a lawyer doing research on this, it'd be very interested to invite them along as well, because there's a whole issue of rights that we haven't yet uh, seen a lot of uh, work on, or at least research. I mean, I know there are legal cases. I mean, there's law in practice. We're going to move to a different topic now. Uh, but as I said, please feel free to keep chatting. And if you have a question for Judith and Janice on these studies or for Kate on their campaign, and I know some of you in other countries may be thinking about this as well, please use the chat uh, and we'll come back to this topic. Thank you all. <laughs>